Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. For this video, I want to present another layout design. And if anyone would like to count the small squares on this scale drawing of the client's basement, they will see that it is by far the largest layout design that I've ever done. It is more than 60 feet long and more than 40 feet wide. So bigger than my workshop in both directions. It's not a clear open space. As you can see, there are a lot of corners involved. It runs through four major rooms. There is a closet in here where the mouse is that the client immediately said he would get rid of if it meant a better layout. There is a bathroom just below it, which the client also was willing to get rid of. Although I suggested that we kept it because it'd be useful to have it for when he holds operating sessions it would mean that his visitors don't have to go upstairs and interrupt his family. There are a couple of areas where there are utilities to be concerned with. Here is his furnace and water heater. And I think the small cylinder is a water softener. But there's a gray area that he said to keep open. The red line around it is the area that I recommended we kept because it didn't seem like he was giving enough space to walk all the way around the furnace. And in this corner, there is the main electrical panel. This is an air compressor for his workshop. Not quite sure what that is, but it needs to stay there. And there is a secondary electrical panel here where the mouse is now. There's also some water pipes in this corner, and there's a water pipe down here. This flight of stairs in this corner leads up to his garage, and he said he wasn't planning on using that very much, so we could block it. These are the main stairs into the house. There are several columns in the middle of the rooms, two in this room at the end, two in this long narrow room across the bottom. There is one in this finished room that is cladded with drywall, although as with the others, it's just a four inch metal pipe inside it. The same with this one down here and the one at the bottom of the stairs. And you've probably noticed that the stairs are in a rather awkward place. They don't have enough space to conveniently walk through here. So clearly anyone coming down the stairs will need to circulate in this other direction. Now also the client mentioned that this north-south wall where the mouse is now is load bearing. But it is possible to get rid of it and replace it with a post and beam system. These black squares in this central dividing wall represent places where support columns are hidden in that wall as well. So most of this wall can be removed as long as we leave certain parts of it. So anyway, that is a rather lengthy introduction to the space that the client has given me to work with. But there is a rule when it comes to model railroad design that doesn't matter how much space you have, it's never going to be enough to build the layout you want. So what did the client want in this space? He wanted to represent Altoona and the grade up through Horseshoe Curve, through Kalitzin and Crescent, and then through the mountains that follow, continuing across the plains of Ohio to Mormon Yard in, uh, in Bellevue, which is one of the largest hump yards in the country. And then from there, northwards to Sandusky on the coast of Lake Erie. So let's now go through the design process and see how it progressed. Here is the first design that I drew. And anyone who is familiar with the areas I've talked about will immediately recognize that it is backwards. Yes, I goofed up. I got my east and west wrong. Something else he asked for was a bar at the base of the horseshoe curve for viewing trains on it. And this is what I first drew, thinking that he wanted it in the middle of the aisle. And then he said, no, he wanted wide scenery in the horseshoe curve with the bar against it, just like I've shown in this view here. So this view shows the whole layout flipped around into the correct orientation. Altoona Yard along the bottom of the basement, through the horseshoe curve, Galitzin, Cresson at the summit, Obviously, this portion of the railroad here can only be mountainous because we've got a forest of support columns to negotiate. So there's gonna to have to be tunnels close together. Oh, and one other scene that he particularly wanted 
was a representation of the town of Vermilion, which is where he grew up. So it had particular significance for him. Then after Vermilion, we head through Mormon Yard in Bellevue, then the main line is going to go down to Staging, and the branch line needs to go north to Sandusky with the coal dock there. And when I drew this one, I wasn't quite sure how we were going to do that. And you'll see that the rest of the space is currently showing a main line east of Altoona. So the next thing we did was to cut that out and make this room available for the Sandusky area. Here is that drawing. Now we had been working with a minimum radius on the main line of 40 inches, which was suggested by the client. So all these curves are 40 inches or better. Actually, most of them are 50 inches or better. The only places where we cut it down to 36 inches is on the branch line to Sandusky. And then the center of this room, we thought would be a good place for a mine. The client wanted at least one mine on the railroad, preferably with a balloon loop through a flood loader. And if it is possible to get two, the second mine would have been conventional straight loading tracks. Now, since we are skipping about 200 miles of main line between Crescent and Vermilion, I suggested wrapping a time-wasting loop around the furnace and utility area, adding some running distance without actually going anywhere, and also helping to get the main line back down from the summit of Crescent to a better operating height. Anyway, when I sent this version to the client, he liked most of what I had done. He immediately suggested that this loop around under the stairs should be moved because the line to Sandusky does actually tie into Bellevue Yard with a Y to the north. So he wanted to know if we could get that in this location where the mouse is now. Here is the version with the Sandusky line tied into Bellevue by means of a Y to the north. At this point, I still have a branch line wrapping around under the stairs because we were toying with the idea of putting an industrial branch in so that the client could incorporate more switching industries that are actually present on the prototype in this area. And the other change that he asked for was to flip Vermilion Yard so that the curve could run through it in the right direction. So now between Crescent and Vermilion, we are wrapping one and a half times around the furnace area and then approaching from the opposite side. This is the only point of the railroad where west to the left and east to the right has been changed. So this scene is viewed from the point of view of somebody standing in Lake Erie and looking south, which is by far the more artistic view. In this view, I'm also showing where the support columns need to go to replace this load bearing wall that's going to come out and get headers instead. Probably a triple 16 inch LVL. In Sandusky, we've had to depart from the prototypical yard arrangement. In the prototype location, there is a fairly large yard to the south of the town, and then the line runs a short distance over an interchange to the loads and empty yards on the coal dock. And the client was hoping to represent the coal unloader as faithfully as possible, but we did have to greatly condense the remainder of the arrangement. And although this would be the final destination for all the coal trains, general merchandise trains would bypass the coal yard and head out through town via a different railroad. So we put in a junction at the start of the Sandusky scene with the main line continuing downgrade and then going to staging. Our version of Sandusky Yard is a terminal yard, although it is double-ended. And at the far end of it, we have a long lead track behind the backdrop at the Altoona end of the railroad. And although the client and I kicked this area around for some considerable time, we kept coming back to this arrangement as neither of us could come up with anything better. We did, however, make one adjustment, stealing some space from the central peninsula so that we could have a larger ship. And although greatly condensed, all the other portions of the railroad are actually much closer to the prototype than the client thought we would ever be able to get. At this point, I started filling in actual track arrangements through the Horseshoe Curve and Cresson area. He's modeling a late error after the second track had already been removed. 
So through Horseshoe Curve, instead of being four closely spaced tracks, there's two tracks close together, and then a service road, and then a third track. We've got most of the major scenic details within the Horseshoe Curve area. The parking lot for the rail park is slightly enlarged so that it can be removable and form an access hatch because of the deep scenery in this area. The tunnel arrangement at Galitzin is fairly accurate, although very much condensed. These tunnels should be far enough apart for a 180 degree curve joining the double and the single track at this point. And clearly we don't have room for that. There is a lumber yard in this location and there's some more trackage over the south side of the main line. I've just put one short maintenance spur between the two main lines and I've deleted one track on the south side. From Galitzin to Cresson there are actually supposed to be five through tracks and a stub track and I've limited the fifth through track. Although we do have the Main Street overpass in the right place, Chestnut Street had to duck under all five tracks instead of coming up in the space in the middle. Cresson Yard is a reasonably faithful copy of the prototype. As I mentioned, there's one track omitted where the mouse is now. And this should be a full Y at this point. Obviously, it was going to have to crash into the backdrop because we certainly don't have space for a full Y here. In a steam aero railroad, the Y would have been important for turning helpers, but with diesel helpers, they're just pairs of locomotives facing one each way, so there's no need to turn them. And there's enough trackage here to handle enough helpers for the client's needs. Since there is a column at the crown of this curve, I suggested moving the feed mill here. It's actually the tallest building in Cresson, although it should actually be near Pennsylvania Avenue rather than the AP Highway. Can't remember what AP stands for. It's a two word name, but you can look it up on Google Maps if you want to. Then shortly after this underpass, there is the overpass for the US 22 interstate. There's another column at this point and neither of us could come up with a satisfactory way of hiding it. We figured the best approach was just to paint it black and ignore it. At the south end of Cresson, the track at the front should continue. The rear track is a passing siding and it comes to an end. The front track should actually continue for several more miles. But we decided just to end them both at the same point. And in later versions of the plan, we put a couple of crossovers and an industrial spur at this point because the client was interested in making this a switching area and control point. That makes sense since the next crossover on the model is more than three scale miles away. At that point, we switched to the opposite end of the railroad and started working on the Sandusky area. And at this point, there was another error in communication. I was told there was an alternative method of loading ships if the main coal dumper was out of order. And I did notice three closely spaced stub ended tracks close together. And it turns out that's incorrect. And there is some kind of big machine in this area which picks up coal that's been dumped and sends it to the ships via a conveyor system. What I'm not sure about from the satellite photographs is how the coal gets there in the first place. But although that portion of the plan is wrong, the rest of it is about the best proportions that we could possibly get in the space. And I have started filling in the arrangement for the coal dumper and the start of the main yard, indicating how it could fit. Here is a later version of that same drawing with the remainder of the Sandusky yard filled in. I've not yet removed those stub tracks, but what we have done here is increase the area available for the lake, allowing for a much bigger ship that the client asked for. Probably the most famous ore boat on the Great Lakes would be the Edmund Fitzgerald, which of course sank well before the period the client was modeling. But we did do some talking about this and thought maybe we would have a modernized sister ship called the Egmund Ditzferald, just swapping a few of the letters around. And the extended outline is the full scale size of such a ship. From memory, I think that is 75 feet wide by 729 feet long, something around there anyway. We also talked about having more industry to switch in Sandusky. There were a few rail served industries and several more candidates that look as though they were either once rail served 
or we felt that they could possibly be without stretching believability too far. Here is another version. You can see I stretched the ship to the full size. Yes, and it turns out I was right, 725 feet long by 75 feet wide. Terminal ready mix is an industry that was just inside the mainline curve of the Y at the interchange. So that's basically the same location relative to the main line as it is here. It's also a tall structure that can make a good job of hiding where the main line disappears from view. There was also Sandusky packing suppliers that lined up directly with a tail track from a turning Y and looked as though it could once have been rail served. There's Ventra manufacturing and a few others that I could have had. There's also a scrapyard there, which is generally a good industry to put at the front of a railroad because it doesn't require any tall structures. There are no locomotive servicing facilities in the prototype for Sandusky, but we felt that we needed some layover tracks here so that we don't have to send locomotives light back to Bellevue for servicing. And I put the two rip tracks in behind the engine layover tracks. Anyway, at this point, the client agreed that we'd got Sandusky as good as we could possibly do so in the space available. Before continuing with other portions of the layout, I went down to the lower level and started working out the approaches to the staging yards. With such a complex and involved layout as this, obviously the staging requirements are going to be significant. As I've already mentioned, the client planned on holding some in-depth operating sessions, requiring a true point-to-point -point with large staging yards at both ends. We have east staging under Bellevue, west staging under Cresson. There is a short connection between them because the client really wanted a double track continuous run so that he could just watch the trains run by when the mood took him. And also we wanted to ensure that coal trains could be loaded and empty in the right direction. So we needed some through staging tracks and here they are under Sandusky. And also the client wanted the ability to run a few very long trains. So I put in four tracks at the back as long as I could possibly squeeze in. He was hoping to get up to about 60 cars. These tracks with appropriate locomotives would only hold about 50 cars, assuming an average car length of 50 feet. We talked about it and decided that a 40 to 50 car train would be far more feasible and actually look better than a 60 car train because the various elements on the visible portion of the railroad are a little too close together to actually run 60 cars and still look good. Most of his trains are going to be in the 30 to 40 car range though. Next, I started working on the Bellevue area. Bellevue is actually three huge yards end to end with the central yard being a hump yard. I'm told it's the second largest hump yard in the country. What I've drawn here represents the west end yard. The Y at the back is very much compressed the east leg of it should actually bypass the yard altogether and come in between the west yard and the center yard. But clearly we don't have room to do that. And the industry at the back, Bunge Foods, is actually a huge industry occupying many acres. We were, however, able to get the Kemper Park area just to the west of the yard reasonably accurate, albeit very much compressed. There is the Main Street underpass with a crossover directly on the bridge. The track arrangement at this junction is just about compressed, although shortened. The Wheeling and Lake Erie branch line curves around sharply to the east. And then there are two double track mains, one continuing to the south and one to the west, connected via a Y. And if one ignores the fact that the modeled main line makes almost a complete 360 degree wrap around the stairs instead of just curving about 70 degrees and heading due west, then we're reasonably close and have a fighting chance of making the town recognizable. There is no room to represent the former nickel plate roundhouse and engine facilities inside the Y, although some of the tracks are now used as a maintenance of way yard, so that's what I've included in there, just ignoring the turntable and roundhouse completely. At the other end of Bellevue, the diesel servicing facilities are in as close a position as possible to where they should be, being sandwiched between two sets of main lines running past the central yard. And of course, the central yard we're not even representing because we don't have room for it. This is just the west yard. 
and the three tracks that curve around behind it have access to the Sandusky route. So all the trains for Sandusky will, will use those three tracks. And the plan is that the coal drags will go through without stopping unless they have to meet a train coming the opposite way. I've used the Haynes Avenue overpass as a means of hiding where the track disappears from this view. It does actually pass over between the central and east yard. There's also some fuel storage tanks at this location. Originally I thought it was an oil dealer. It turns out it's actually the fuel oil for the diesel facilities for the, for, for the railroad. Although with the distortion of this area on the model, it's going to be too far away to look as though it belongs. I'll show you later how we got around that. This drawing shows the intermediate level. I've called it the mezzanine, showing the main line coming down from Sandusky, a Y under the mine, so that the trains can either go down to staging or reappear at the other end of the railroad in Altoona. And also on this level, there is the Wheeling and Lake Erie staging yard. I've called it Norwalk staging because that is the next significant sized town on that route. And that just curves around under Tresson about halfway between the two levels, because at this point, the upper level is at the highest elevation on the railroad. Well, this video is now getting long enough. I always intended splitting it into two parts, and I'm guessing this is gonna be a good place to split it. So I'll break it here and continue next time. And I hope to see you back then. So in the meantime, thanks for watching and bye for now.